Thank you very much. Uh, actually, 20 years ago, I saw a talk by Rocky, and we were joking with my friends. We were saying the poor guy was to speak after Rocky because he's so, uh, you know, he's so charismatic. <laughs> and so here, here we go. I have a privilege <laughs> to follow. You're not a guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So at least I'm bringing a bit of diversity. And as Rocky said, I have to flash uh, the usual transparency. But what I want to show you, uh, the, the main thing which is going to be very important for my talk is the fact that, uh, as Justin said, uh, we have uh, evidence from rotation uh, curves of galaxy that uh, basically the galaxy, uh, our galaxy, our disk, uh, is bathing in, uh, in a halo of invisible particles. So we know that, in principle, there is a halo of particles that we should be finding. And the question is, what are those particles? Now, the main thing also for me is the main evidence for dark matter is actually the CMB, but not, not so much because it tells us that we need some dark matter, but more because we have a spectrum, and this spectrum has tiny error bars. And the reason why I think it's ex absolutely crucial is the following reason. So we, you, uh, basically, you heard before from Rocky that there are alternatives uh, to dark matter, and some of them are basically a modification of gravity. So the most naive one, to some extent, which is just local, is called MOND. Uh, but there are some more sophisticated versions, and the TEVS was actually one of the most sophisticated versions. This one in particular, what it does is it can uh, basically modify gravity at a time where the photons decouple from matter. And this means that essentially you should see a signature of modifying gravity in the cosmological microwave background. So we did study what would happen if uh, the gravity was modified. And um, what you're going to see here, basically the first peak here, is, um, is a curve. So you will see several curves, and I'm not sure you see very well, but the faintest actually is where the data, where we have data. And this is confirming on very large scales that we have uh, a universe which looks like lambda CDM. But what you see is that if you had TVS and also with a cosmological constant, you wouldn't have this first peak and then the rest of them. You would have something completely off, which is b given by the dashed line. Now, this means that uh, even a modification of gravity that is extremely complex and which does modify gravity at uh, recombination is not successful, doesn't reproduce a CMB. So it is actually ruled out. So the reason why it's ruled out is that in a, in a theory like this, you have only ordinary matter. And ordinary matter interacts with light. And by doing this, it actually damps the fluctuation. It does the, the baryons, the matter, ordinary matter, never stays in the same place, if you want. And uh, you cannot um, collapse those regions enough to form the galaxies. So what you, you need to, to do if you want to modify gravity is actually to add some dark matter. And of course, if you just modify gravity, you don't want to add some dark matter, because there is no point. But as Rocky explained, we have a dark matter candidate in the standard model in particle physics is neutrinos. We know that they have a small mass. So if you have a modification of gravity and a small neutrino mass, then you get a different curve. You get the one which is actually, for the first peak, is underneath uh, lambda CDM. And then it will depart, and that would be the, <coughs> sorry, that would be the straight line. Now what you see again is the first peak works, you, you're actually going to fit the CMB data that you have, the second peak kind of work, but then you see that compared to this curve, you have a damping. And again, this is because you have too many baryons and the baryons dissipate, this is called the self damping. So essentially, um, there are many, I mean, you can try in many ways, but to my knowledge, there is no successful modification of gravity which avoid this problem. And so because of that, I mean, of course you cannot predict that nobody will um, ever find a modification of gravity which reproduces CMB so well as a dark matter candidate, uh, as a particle. But so far, it's clear that we don't know how to modify gravity and reproduce the CMB data. Therefore, the simplest option for a moment is to assume that the dark matter is indeed made of new particles. Now, if you do this, and I'm going to repeat, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat uh, a fair amount of things that you heard in the previous talks, but I will try to give a different uh, spin. So if you assume that it's a particle, then you need to explain why, it's only, um, <coughs> why it represents only 25% of uh, the, the matter content in the universe, sorry, of the um, energy content in the universe. And if you were assuming that the particles just are there and don't do anything, they don't interact, you would have far too many compared to the observed abundance that you see. So the, the main uh, 
hypothesis that people do in this area is to assume that the dark matter was actually, the particles were actually produced thermally. And this means they were in contact with uh, the electrons, the photon, and so on, they thermalize. And eventually, the other assumption is that they can actually annihilate. There is a third assumption, which is we assume that there is no asymmetry between the dark matter particle and anti-dark matter particle. And this is extremely convenient because this means, as Eroki explained, that we can predict the number of particles we should see for a given uh, probability that they annihilate. So the equation is this one, is a Boltzmann equation, and Rocky show you this plot. Um, what you need to understand is that, so here you have a number, of, I mean, this is basically the quantity of dark matter that is left. So this long, the, the, the 11 orders of magnitude uh, that Lee and Weinberg left uh, is basically to tell you what you have from that moment of freeze out to nowadays. Now this, uh, basically, this means here that you have too many dark matter particles. Here you may have too little dark matter particles. The truth is somewhere here. But if you have a very large cross-section, a large annihilation cross-section, you won't have any dark matter left. So if the cross-section is very large, you will be somewhere here. But if you don't have any probability to annihilate, you will have too many particles left. So you'll be somewhere here. So if you have observed with precision the amount of dark matter that you have nowadays, you exactly know what is the probability that they should annihilate. So you exactly know which curve you are, and you exactly know what is the cross-section. Now we know, I mean, we know that uh, this quantity of dark matter that we have uh, nowadays is, a, is equal basically to a cosmological parameter given here, which is 0.1. So we immediately deduce that the cross-section, as Rocky said, is 310 to minus 26 centimeter cubed per second. Now the question is, how do you do this? And as Rocky explained again, uh, the most logical thing is to assume well, you have a massive particle which annihilate into fermions, for example. And in fact, there was more than Lee and Weinberg, there was also Hutt who did the same calculation, the same, more or less the same uh, assumptions. And if you assume that the dark matter is, um, is just basically exchanging a heavy particle, you end up with a cross-section which is given by the following, which is the ratio of the dark matter mass square divided by the mass of a particle which is mediated. Here, the, I mean, in historically, they consider that the particle which was mediated was a W boson. So what you see here is that the dark matter um, cannot be too light because the cross-section would be too small, and therefore you would, you would have too many dark matter particles left. And uh, equally, you cannot have a dark matter which is too heavy because the cross-section would be too large and you won't have enough dark matter left. So their, their result was basically that you have a narrow window. And you're in between a few GeV to a few TeV. And this is only if the dark matter is thermal, and you can question this. But uh, this is for a moment the hypothesis I'm going to also assume just for, for the time being. Now, as Rocky explained, you, once you've done this, once you assume that you have this window, you, in principle, you have something very predictive. Instead of having the whole dark matter mass range, you now have only three orders of magnitude to explore. But then people realize that this is a little bit simple. And in fact, you realize this once you start to exclude the, the whole parameter space, you start to think, well, did I make a mistake and uh, should I not open it more? So this is a role of theoretician to actually challenge even their previous work. Right? So as Rocky again explained, you have this principle of co-annihilation. And what it means is that so a simple annihilation means you have two particles of the same nature, which meet and basically disappear. They produce something else, whether they are fermions from a standard model or, or something else. So you can have two dark matter candidates. For example, you can have dark matter one, which annihilate, produce something. And then you can have dark matter two, which annihilate, produce something else. The co-annihilation case means that actually you can have those two particles meeting. They don't have to be two dark matter particles. In fact, you can have one dark matter candidate which actually can co-annihilate with another particle that is not the dark matter, but it's living at the same time of the dark matter. And so this would be this third process. And so in the equation, which is the Boltzmann equation, you have an additional term, which is the co-annihilation term. Now, this formula doesn't really uh, bring you much information, but I'm just going to show you what it really does. So I'm going to take an example with supersymmetry where you have a stop and the neutralino. So you, I guess you understood that neutralinos are the lightest supersymmetric particle and they're supposedly their best, um, or at least in the old paradigm, certainly their best dark matter candidate. And the stop is basically a quark, is a supersymmetric partner of a quark top. 
So what happens is when those particles, when those two particles have a possibility to co-annihilate, you have a different type of relic density that you will manage to achieve. So for example, if a dark matter is, um, sorry, if a neutralino is around uh, 100 or 200 GeV, then it can co-annihilate with the stop if the stop has a mass in between basically zero and 100 GeV. In reality, it's not true because a candidate, um, so what I meant here is, uh, is a dark matter, sorry, this mass should be the dark matter mass plus uh, a difference which is in between zero and 100 GeV. So in reality, if you do this here, you have a relic density which is 0.5, which is far too much compared to observation. In, in reality now, we know that the relic density is 0.1. So what you can do is having a dark matter candidate, a neutralino, which is around, let's say, 200 GeV again, which is here. So it's 200 times the proton mass. And the stop can be uh, 220 or 30 uh, GeV, and then it can co-annihilate with a neutralino. What does it do? Well, just it gives you the right relic density, and that's all. So in principle, this is just an additional way to get the relic density. But where it, comes, I mean, where it becomes extremely interesting is that instead, you can look at the whole range. Instead of just looking here, I can look uh, at the whole range. And now you see that uh, if the stop co-annihilate with a neutralino, you can actually uh, go to masses which are not just a few TeV like uh, Lee Weinberg fan, you can actually have something around two TeV. And in principle, with this one, now we know it's not possible anymore, but with this one, we could uh, go up to four TeV. So the co-annihilation was a way to already say, well, actually, maybe the Lee Weinberg limit is correct, but it's uh, just assuming annihilation. If you have co-annihilation, you can change the bound a little bit. It's not dramatic, but it's opening the parameter space a little bit more. So why do I speak about this in the context of, uh, of uh, fine-tuning is because this is extremely important uh, in terms of searches for dark matter for the following reason. So you've seen also the, the notion of uh, direct detection where people indeed dress up in a funny suit with a problem that then you don't recognize them and you can, mistake, uh, you can make actually the mistake of confusing the experiment. But, uh, so, uh, the principle, I mean, the principle, as you've seen, is just a mountain a detector hidden, basically to avoid receiving any kind of uh, radiation. On what you want is just the, um, the, the type of neutral particles weakly interacting, and you hope they would be massive enough. And you need to be lucky, they need to interact in your detector. Now, as Ruki also explained, they, you start very high. I mean, uh, when I started my PhD, basically people were looking for dark matter in this range. Okay, and um, progressively we ended up because of the co-annihilation in this range. So what happened here is that basically, as soon as we put the co-annihilation, mm -hmm. we actually have to fine tune because we need to have. So if I just go back to this plot, we need to go back where I told you I can go to four GeV or two TeV. Two, sorry, four TeV or two, two TeV. You need to have a mass difference between the neutralino and the stop, which is extremely small. So here you're starting to fine tune your parameter to have this co-annihilation happening. So on this plot is the same principle. As you're uh, basically trying to reach very large masses, you start to have more and more processes which are extremely fine tuned. And you're just pushing basically, as you had fine tuning, you're just pushing, you're just decreasing the cross section and you're pushing your region towards the right and uh, the bottom. So uh, the co-annihilation, if you want, in terms of fine tuning, gives you this. So if I just take the dramatic example here, where basically I could have co-annihilation even with a difference of mass of 100 GeV between the neutralino and the stop, then um, basically all this region means that the co-annihilation is not so important. And this is a region actually where you have a lot of interaction without, you don't need co-annihilation, you have lots of interaction anyway. Uh, and you have enough annihilation to do the relic density. So in this region, basically, you can have co-annihilation, but the main, uh, the main part is driven by the dark matter annihilation, the neutralino annihilation. This case is actually the Bino, which we heard uh, is almost excluded now. But when you add co-annihilation, then you start to open up the parameter space, which in principle is good. But what you do too is you now narrow at the same time you're imposing a specific relation between, so this would be indirectly the mass of the stop 
This is not exactly the mass of a star, but it's just one component. And this is basically uh, half the mass, uh, sorry, twice the mass of a neutralino. So those are supersymmetric parameters. And what's going to happen is that initially you have open uh, this parameter space, and as you have more and more data and you have to fine tune more and more your parameter space, what you obtain is a narrow strip. So eventually all this gray, green region is going to be reduced to a very uh, fine line. And this indicates the amount of fine tuning you have, you must have, in order to have a good neutralino as a dark matter candidate. So, Nonetheless, if you accept this fine tuning, mm -hmm. what you have now is the possibility to have basically a dark matter candidate, which is not just between GeV and TeV, but goes a little bit further. And then, of course, it will depend what kind of co-annihilation you're assuming to, to know the, the final limit. But in principle, you can open the parameter space in the thermal assumption, so in the, I mean, in the setup uh, set by Lee and Weinberg. Now, you could do something else. You could just say, well, I completely I disagree with uh, uh, Hutt, Lee, and Weinberg. I don't need thermal dark matter. Maybe the dark matter was produced like this. So this is a case with whimsy, yes. And then you can go all over. Oops, sorry. You can go all over. I mean, you, you don't have any more limits. The only thing you need to care is to explain the relic density, but you don't, you don't need to use basically the process um, of um, the, Lee, sorry, the, the Boltzmann equation. So, I mentioned this, um, uh, this co-annihilation, which is a way to uh, remove the upper limit on uh, the neutralino mass, for example, of a dark matter candidate mass. But actually, there is uh, something else you can do. And just going back here, you can actually also question this limit. So in principle, this limit comes from the fact that if the uh, cross-section is proportional to the dark matter mass, and if the dark matter mass is too small, you would have too many dark matter left. But this assumes you, you obtain this conclusion because you have assumed that the dark matter is actually made of something which looks like a neutrino. So the question is, is it actually dark matter dependent, I mean candidate dependent? Have you biased your conclusion because you just look at one specific candidate? And I, I did a simple exercise during, actually during my PhD. I was thinking, okay, let's take something else drastically different. Instead of taking just um, uh, something which looks like a neutrino, let's take a particle which doesn't have a spin, so a scalar. In this case, you can annihilate, you can do exactly the same diagram as before. Instead of having a W boson, I'm replacing it. I'm replacing the mediator of the annihilation by a heavy particle. I don't know what it is, but I know it has a spin, wha spin one half. This has no spin. And I can have basically this uh, type of annihilation. So I can produce a pair of electron and positron through this diagram. And of course, I mean, uh, after it's a Feynman diagram, so I have to do basically the, this diagram and then the crossing and so on. Then I can compute the cross section, which is associated with this. And what I get is uh, a cross section which has this expression. So at that stage, you probably don't care anymore. But the important point is that nowhere here you see the dark matter mass. And so by actually assuming that the dark matter is a scalar, I obtain the probability for the dark matter to annihilate, which is independent of the dark matter mass. So the Lee and Weinberg limit, which assume that the cross-section is proportional to the dark matter mass, is gone because it's not valid here. Because in, in this precise case, I have no dependence in, dependen in terms of the dark matter mass. And this is one particular way of escaping this limit, but then you can think about another one. And the other one was actually thinking, okay, I'll go back to the case where, uh, which um, uh, Lee and Weinberg and Hurt were considering. I can consider something which looks like a neutrino, but now I introduce, instead of having a heavy particle which is mediated, I can introduce a particle which is light. So something which would look like, for example, a Z boson, but it would be a different type of Z boson. I'm assuming it's lighter. I'm assuming it doesn't have the same way of coupling as a Z boson. So I'm completely inventing it. But I'm just assuming, well, what happens if it exists? And if it exists, what you get is a cross-section which is, again, like uh, in the case of Hutt and Weinberg, depends on the dark matter mass. However, because this particle, I, I mean, it's a particle I invented, I can also assume it's light. If it's light, then in this case, I can get the right relic density by just assuming that the couplings are matching the, I mean, I need a cross-section which is 310 to minus 26 centimeter cubed per second. So if, uh, depending on the parameters I've chosen for the dark matter mass and the Z prime, 
I just need to fine tune basically the coupling and then I get the right really density in this scenario. So I can have light dark matter but it has to be, in this case, followed by a light mediator. Or I can have a light mediator, uh, sorry, a light particle dark matter, but I can have whatever I want for the mediator. So actually, this means that um, in terms of parameter space, even within the thermal uh, scenario, within you know, the context that uh, Hutt and Lien Weinberg were considering, I actually I can go uh, everywhere I want, as long as I have the right candidate where the cross-section is either the independent of the dark matter mass or allow me to have a light uh, mediator. So you can go from, of course, you can, once you, you know that you don't need to have a, a candidate which is heavier than a proton, you can go down to uh, the smallest mass you want. But then you have to remember what uh, Justin was saying. If you have a candidate which is a dark matter candidate which is too light, so for example, uh, less than a few keV, then you would have something which is more than warm dark matter. It would look like hot dark matter. And this means that you won't be able to explain the, the smallest galaxies. And in fact, you may have difficulties to form galaxies. So you can't really, you can play this game with thermal dark matter. You can go up to here, but then you have a problem here. So you can, you can say, okay, I, I have opened now this parameter space from key EV to whatever I want. And the you know, everything here needs to be different from thermal dark matter. It could be non-thermal, but it, it has to be non-thermal in that case, but it can't be thermal. So now I told you, well, we can play this game. I can have a light a mediator if I want, and that was true uh, 15 years ago. But actually, uh, experimentalists done a fantastic job, and once they realized that, they said, okay, let's look for light mediators. And as we heard, you can produce them easily in experiments, in particle physics experiments. So you end up, so 15 years ago, the only constraint was a G minus two. So I was basically happy to live here. And as you can see now, 15 years later, experimentalists have excluded more or less the whole parameter space. So I know that the young people are more optimistic than me. So uh, some people convinced me I should be looking here, which I was already, <laughs> but uh, it's still open. And then we have all this range to explore. But you can see that the, limit, the amount of um, fine tuning you need is extremely big if you want to play in that range because experimentalists have put very strong constraints. So to go back to, to this uh, specific case where I was telling you here I can do whatever I want, well, it's true, but then I should remember that LHC is chasing the case. And nowadays this is called vector like fermions. You have limits or so. So you have to be a bit careful. You can't do everything you want, but so far I think you if there are a few TeV, you can still live with this kind of diagram and have light dark matter. On the other hand, for those ones, you have to be essentially creative. You have to make sure you evade the limits which exist already. And so you need to be uh, in the right parameter space. Now again, I mean, this is not the end of the story because uh, you have now to look at the astrophysics. And astrophysics tells you, well, if you have a dark matter halo surrounding a galactic disk and it's made of particles, and if they annihilate into fermions, so charged particles, they would also produce photons. And if they produce photons, this means you're going to see them. So in principle, you can just say, if I know the dark matter mass, then I can predict the signature, the gamma ray signature, sorry, the electromagnetic signature, and then you can compare with the experiments. And it turns out that, again, you have many experiments which hold out most of the parameter space. So in particular, if the dark matter is light, so this is basically uh, the GeV is here, uh, MeV is here, so from GeV to MeV, you can see that there are huge, uh, I mean, a huge number of limits. And this is basically the latest one from CMB. So this means now, if you have a dark matter candidate, the cross-section needs to be very small. And by small, I mean essentially uh, five orders of magnitude, almost five orders of magnitude, smaller than the relic density itself. So if you want to play with those diagrams, you can, but they need to be suppressed. If they are suppressed, they can't explain the relic density. So you cannot use them to explain why this light dark matter would have the right relic density. But then you could say, well, I have this diagram, on the other hand, the Z prime. And in that case, even though it's constrained, it's very constrained, if I'm creative enough, then in that case, the annihilation cross-section is velocity dependent, and I will evade <coughs> almost everywhere those constraints. It's a little bit tough nowadays, but um, it's just borderline. You can still do it. But because it's a bit tough, people thought, okay, well, why don't we stop thinking about just one particular model? 
why don't we actually use now a, a more generic way of describing the dark matter in terms of particle physics? And so you can be very um, um, exhaustive in the sense that you can say, well, dark matter can be a spin zero, can be a spin one half, can be a spin one. And then the mediator will be correspondingly a spin one half, a spin zero, uh, or a spin one, uh, sorry, a spin zero or so for the other case. So you can basically have this uh, classification. You don't need to look what's in it, but uh, it's just to show you all the cases that people are considering now. But once you've done this, there is no reason to do it only for light dark matter. You can also do it for heavy dark matter. But once you've done this also, you, why do you want to do this only for annihilations? You could also do it for any type of searches for dark matter. So you can do it for direct detection, you can do it for LHC searches. And we heard pre in previous talk that you have uh, two types of um, uh, interactions in a detector. You have spin-dependent and spin-independent. Uh, was, uh, I mean, this is the spin independent, the spin dependent for all the models I showed you before. And what happened is that people, by doing this exercise of looking at all possible models, people realize that actually we also biased our interpretation of how the dark matter can interact with nuclei. In reality, you have all those other ways to interact. They kind of suppress generally by the fact that uh, the dark matter has a small velocity and doesn't have much momentum. So all of those are less important than those two types of uh, interaction, but still they're there. And this shows in certain cases that, in fact, for example, for this kind of model, this term would go to zero. There'll be no other interaction for this specific model than just this one. So before you would say it doesn't interact at all, this dark matter candidate would not interact in a detector. And now, in fact, we realize actually it does, it's surprised, but it does interact in a detector, but with a very specific uh, form factor. So you can combine everything and get constraints. And now I just wanted to show you, because we are talking about fine tuning, the result, the result is that everything is excluded. We kind of knew that because we didn't see the dark matter. But uh, however, when you look, you see that also, I mean, maybe you, do, you don't see so much, but uh, it's very, uh, this plot with all the exclusion is for very large couplings. So then the question is what happens if you decrease the coupling? And if you decrease the coupling, actually, you will go in that direction and this one. So you will actually allow more parameter space again. You will open up the parameter space again. So in terms of fine tuning, this means that if you want to survive, if you want to have a good dark matter candidate for pretty much all the models you can think about, you will have to decrease the coupling. You will need very small couplings. So this means you need a small probability that the dark matter interacts with the visible world. So this means that we have no chance or very little chance to detect it. That's the only way we can explain to have a dark matter candidate still viable today, to have almost no chance to detect it. So you realize that we, are in a we have a problem. And that's exactly uh, the situation <laughs> that we need to sort out. We need to see, we need to find a way to test whether this is true, the dark matter doesn't interact with us, Oh, this is completely nonsense. We didn't understand. We, maybe we didn't understand the CMB properly. We, we don't understand maybe some modification of gravity and so on. Whatever it is, but we need to make sure. Given that we don't have this interaction, we need to make sure it's the right solution. Sorry. So just again, so just to make sure uh, my point is clear. Um, if you hear, basically, if you have a light dark matter of a few MeV, so this means basically the same mass as an electron, you know that it almost doesn't interact with a uh, with, um, visible world. But it can still interact, as I say, I mean, with weak interaction, really, but through a Z prime. You can invent something else, which now people call dark photon, which is ex essentially the same thing, but uh, with a bit more freedom. Then you can invent uh, a Higgs prime. It would be the same as a Higgs, but with different mass and so on. But in reality, you don't have so much choice. It's extremely constrained. So all of this basically means you have a few, I mean, just three possibilities and that's all. If you want to play in this low mass range, you, you don't have much choice. And you need to make sure that whatever you introduce has not been ruled out by experiment. On the other hand, there is one uh, case that people didn't really take seriously and I think is actually extremely fascinating, which is that if you have a light dark matter candidate, it could annihilate into neutrinos. Now, it could annihilate with a particle which is very light too, if you want, whatever you want, because how are you going to test that? It's completely invisible. And so I was 
claiming to my, f to my friends that uh, you, know, you can do whatever you want. If dark matter annihilates into neutrinos, you're safe. You can have a right relic density. You will never see it. And then how can people prove you're wrong, right, Rocky? Because you introduced that to some extent. <laughs> so um, one case, for example, coming back to what I showed you before, it's exactly the same diagram as I show you where I was writing an F going to a plus or minus. This is exactly the same, but now I replace the F, the charged particle, by a neutrino. So exactly the same expression. But there is a problem here, because when you have a neutrino, the neutrino in principle, from the standard model, has only left couplings. And uh, when I write CL and CR, those are couplings, which correspond to left and right neutrinos. So in principle, this should be zero. Uh, sorry, so you have only the left component, and then this should be zero. But now you see that I would have a cross-section, which is proportional to the mass of a neutrino, divided by this particle. And if, I mean, the neutrino has a mass which cannot exceed a few EV, so then you would have a very small cross-section. So the only way you can do this diagram, if it's a normal neutrino, is to have actually a mediator which is extremely light, because otherwise you will have again the problem of the relic density. So is it possible? Well, not really, because if you have a very light mediator, you would actually see it, because this particle would eventually decay into neutrinos, would increase the number of neutrinos. So you have to be a little bit careful. However, if a neutrino is a Majorana, then you have something else, because in this case, the left and right are basically equal. So you cannot distinguish. I should replace this formula. I should have only one coupling, which I, I can't tell whether it's left or right. It's only one coupling. Then it's only one coupling. And then you can see that now I have a cross-section which is independent of a neutrino mass, independent of a dark matter mass, and back on track, I can do whatever I want. Okay? So if the neutrinos are Majorana in this case, I could say, okay, I can do the relic density, and I'd, all I need is a particle, a mediator, which has the right, relic, uh, right uh, value, the right mass. Now, the thing is, uh, Rocky actually showed in 1986, I think, that if you have a particle which annihilates into neutrinos, you can reheat the neutrino sector. If you reheat the neutrino sector, you can actually be mistaken in the fact that you may, you may actually think you have, by reheating, you have increased to some extent the um, the energy density in the neutrino sector, and you may think that, in fact, you have more neutrinos than what you have. So here you have only three. I mean, I'm not adding any neutrinos, but because I changed their temperature, I can be misled to think that I added a new species. However, there is something extremely neat about this, and I, I will try to show you now. Ten minutes, okay. So if you have um, annihilation into neutrinos, then you have a source scattering into neutrinos, like Feynman was saying. And then you can have, on top of that, a neutrino mass term. You can compute this based. It only depends on those, on those parameters. So everything is related. If you fix the relic density, you fix the value of this term. And then what you obtain is a neutrino mass term, which is exactly within the observed range. And surprisingly, the way it works is that it requires a particle which is in the MeV range. So if you have a MeV particle annihilating into neutrinos, you can have the right relic density, you have a fairly large scattering cross-section, and then you have a neutrino mass within the observed range. So it sounds like everything is okay. But then you have to look at the impact on the CMB, and that's where you get problem. So on the CMB, and that's where it becomes really fascinating, because if you look now what the CMB looks like in this scenario where the dark matter is a light particle of a few MeV interacting with neutrinos, you get this, um, basically this announcement of uh, the first peak. And the reason is that by coupling the dark matter to the neutrino, you also prevent the neutrino to do what they're supposed to do, which is free stream. So the neutrinos, in principle, do not interact with anything, and they're extremely light. So they can go away, and, and because they go away, you cannot clump them. But if you couple the dark matter to the neutrino, and if the cross-section is not negligible, then you're preventing the neutrino to go away and you're helping them to clump. So you end up with more structures than what you expected. And uh, it's not dramatic, you may think it's ruled out, but in reality it's not, because you have some freedom to make it fitting the data. And in particular, you have the value of the cross-section, but most importantly, you have this parameter, the number of extra degree of freedom, which looks like the number of neutrinos you added. So you have another parameter which is important, is the age of the universe. And so you can actually fit the observation by increasing the age of the universe and increasing the amount of neutrinos, or conversely, increasing the energy density in the neutrino sector, which would look like the annihilation. 
So you have to look at the structure formation. And this is basically uh, the work was, uh, that uh, Justine mentioned, where what I'm going to show you is actually done for a coupling between dark matter and photon, but this is the same for dark matter and neutrinos. Here is a normal cold dark matter, and we have just zoomed in in the Milky Way. And now we're going to actually look at what happened, what the, how the Milky Way looked like if you have a coupling with neutrinos. And here we go. So what you can see now is all the little satellites that you have in cold dark matter have disappeared. As soon as you couple the dark matter to radiation, neutrinos, photons, you actually got rid of all the little satellites. And the reason is that you induce some kind of damping. So the, the effect that is called, uh, I mean, essentially self-damping is a generalized version. Now, if you have increased the cross section, you have even less structures. But now this is great because this is not a Milky Way. We don't live in this Milky Way because we know the Milky Way of satellites. So you can rule out, basically, this is a cross section which is too large. And you can rule it out. So this means that you can actually uh, tell something about particle physics with cosmology. And it's more than that. You can constrain something which is completely invisible for a particle physicist with cosmology. And that, for me, was absolutely remarkable. But what's even more rem remarkable is that in those models, which actually just do, uh, which are just compatible with uh, data, you find an age of the universe, which is actually what people have observed with late-time measurements. Using strong lensing and using cepheids, they obtain uh, a value which is actually different from cold dark matter. And uh, in this case, you have a natural agreement. OK, so I'm rushing now. So I just wanted to show you. So in, in my range, I was looking at everything below a few GeV. And I show you what happened if you consider uh, MeV candidate, for example, annihilating into neutrinos. But now you could also wonder what happened if, if a dark matter is a neutrino or something related to a neutrino. In particular, if it's a sterile neutrino, what we know is that it will decay also into neutrino and would produce a photon. So we have many limits, and a lot of people were actually hoping, and I know that yeah, one person in particular probably was hoping to uh, uh, see an effect. In, um, so essentially, if you have this decay, you would see a, um, a gamma ray line in objects like clusters of galaxies and galaxies. There was an excess observed uh, in one particular cluster, for example, which is called Perseus. And people interpret it as um, a seven key EV sterile neutrino. And the question is, how can you detect it? And can you make sure this, sterile, I mean, this uh, line is related to a sterile neutrino or not? Uh, so there was a satellite that uh, probably you know about, which is, uh, astro initially was called astro H and then Itomi. Unfortunately, uh, sorry for the bad joke, but it's been atomized. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have a result from this experiment. But um, several people, I mean, from two uh, three different experiments, people claim that there is a line which corresponds to half uh, the mass uh, of uh, sterile neutrino of 7 keV, which is 3.5 keV. And if it's true, then there could be uh, an indication that the dark matter is indeed um, related to neutrinos. But in this case, you have to be a little bit careful because it shouldn't decay too fast. And if it decays too fast, for example, you may, may not see any more structures because the dark matter would just go away. So you have to make sure that the, the um, lifetime that you measured with a signal in gamma ray is actually compatible with uh, the uh, universe that you see and that Justin show you. If you have a, a short, sorry, a lifetime which is too short, then you may not have any structure left. And that's not going to describe the universe you live in. OK, so just um, I will speed up and go to the conclusion I just want to show you now. So um, in this range, basically, you can go up to a few keV assuming thermal dark matter. Uh, here at the border, you can live with sterile neutrinos, which are non-thermal. But then you can go uh, to the lower mass with axions, and we discuss them a little bit. But then nobody discussed, I mean, we did a little bit, but nobody showed you exactly what happened here. And in reality, uh, if you have a candidate which has strong interaction in this uh, plot, what you expect is uh, a power spectrum which has also a strong suppression. So you would expect that if a dark matter is strongly interacting in the early universe, you would have trouble to form galaxies. But it only happened for certain type of, of uh, cross-section and masses. So I will just go to the conclusion, I guess, if I found the conclusion. OK. So, um, if I go back to my plot, uh, this, this range is essentially extremely fine-tuned because this is a supersymmetric range. Anything you're going to invent will, uh, is excluded already, essentially. So unless you uh, 
add a, a, a very large amount of fine tune, uh, you, you were go you're going to have a candidate that has been excluded. Here you can play a little bit. It will be fine tuned to some extent, but the problem is just to make sure that you actually have a candidate. I mean, uh, all the particles you're going to propose need to, uh, to actually um, be looked not only in particle physics, but also in astrophysics. And in most cases, you will find that it's actually very difficult. So you will need, again, a lot of fine tuning to evade the, the limits. You can play in this range. It's not so fine tuned. The problem here is that you lose the predictivity because here you, you could play with a thermal assumption and then you could just use the Boltzmann equation to predict everything you needed. Here you have basically to uh, find another way to predict uh, that you have the, I mean, basically to predict and to show that you have the right candidate. Now you can play with a very large cross section, so you can have dark matter candidates which interact very strongly, and there is no fine tuning because you've never seen that anyway, and you have no experiments which can prove that the dark matter has self-interaction because we didn't see the dark matter. So you're fine if you don't want any fine tuning, you should play here. The problem is that you have to engineer everything to stay here. And if, for example, you mix these strongly interacting dark matter particles with uh, a way to interact with the visible world, then you, you do dramatic <coughs> things to the universe and you start to see it. So you really have, if you want to play, if you want to avoid the fine tuning, you have to make sure that your model is designed to just interact with itself, the dark matter interacts with itself, and almost nothing else. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>